much, Brother Patrick, for moderating powerfully. May God richly bless you. And welcome, Senior. We missed you in the first service. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yeah, we are today um, tackling the topic uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit by the grace of God. And I want to bring to our attention uh, that uh, Sitam Church or oh Christ is the Answer Ministry subscribe to the infilling of the Holy Spirit with the outward evidence of speaking in tongues. Praise the Lord. I know in front here we can see our logo. Our logo, normally people say that it is a bird. And then when I was in Kisumu, some people were complaining, why is it that that bird of Sitam is looking down instead of looking up? That is what they were saying. But I want also to clarify that today to us here, that this is not a bird. Uh, okay, it is um, a symbol of the Holy Spirit in form of a dove. The dove is looking down. If we read in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11 uh, to uh, the end there, we will realize that when Jesus was baptized in water, uh, the Holy Spirit descended on him in form of a dove. So this uh, dove looking down or the Holy Spirit descending, looking down, is meant to descend on us as believers and also uh, affirm us as children of God that God is well pleased with us. Amen. Praise the Lord. So I want to read a scripture from the book of Acts chapter 2 and verse 1 to 4. The Bible says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all gathered in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Amen. Amen. Sorry. What is baptism in the Holy Spirit? What is baptism in the Holy Spirit? Baptism is an act of immersion. Baptism is an act of immersion. The word baptism is derived from the ancient Greek word baptizo or baptizen, whichever, which means to dip or to immerse. We have three kinds of baptism in the New Testament. Number one, we have the baptism in the water, which is done by, by a pastor, a church pastor or a church elder, and which was done by John the Baptist in the book of Matthew chapter three and verse 11. It is not John, it is Matthew chapter three and verse 11. For John says, I baptize you in water for repentance. But there is another person who is going to come who is more powerful than me that is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So we have baptism in water. Then another kind of baptism we go through in the New Testament is identified from the book of John chapter 16 and verse 8 where the Bible says the Holy Spirit when he comes is going to convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of the coming judgment. So when we hear the gospel, those of us who are here who got born again, when we heard the gospel, there was somebody ministering deep in our hearts. Many people say, I had something telling me. It is not something. 
that is the person of the Holy Ghost. He convicts us. Like when I'm speaking to you right now, the Holy Spirit is convicting you. So the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. Then we come to repentance and he, baptiz he baptizes us in Jesus Christ. Baptism number three. We can see this from the book of Acts chapter 1 verse 5. And where Jesus said, told the disciples, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And the baptizer uh, in the Holy Spirit is Jesus himself. Jesus immerses us. We have, I, I told you from the beginning, it is either it is too deep, deep completely or immerse. Physically, when we baptize people, we immerse them. Sometime I have once baptized and I found some people being very stiff. They don't want to be immersed. We can immerse you many times. You can struggle with it until you go deep inside. That is immersion. So the way we are immersed in water, that is the way we are supposed to be immersed in Jesus Christ. So that there is no mention of sin anywhere. We are completely immersed in Jesus Christ. And that is what is going to happen or what ha happened to you or what will happen to you when you are immersed in the Holy Spirit. So it is an immersion. Those are the three kinds of baptism. In the Old Testament, uh, there is a prophet who, who, predict, who predicted uh, about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Just like the birth of Christ, baptism in the Holy Spirit was foretold as one of the events of the coming redemption. In the book of Prophet Joel, chapter 2, verse 28 to 29, the Bible says, And afterwards I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will dream dreams. Your young your, 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 your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Praise the Lord. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit used to uh, be poured only to a few people. The, the, the prophets, the, the rulers, civil rulers like Kina, King uh, David, King Saul, uh, like craftsmen like Oli, Oliab, Oliab in Genesis, um, and on, on kings. There they were a few people that used to operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. But Joel was prophesying in our days, these last days. God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That is the thing. None of us is exempted from that. Then we have confirmations of Joel's prophecy in the New Testament. Number one, by John the Baptist in the book of Matthew, chapter 3 and verse 11. I had talked about that. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11. John says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That is a confirmation from John the Baptist in the New Testament. Number two, then prior to his ascension, Jesus directed his disciples to stay in Jerusalem and wait to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. This is found uh, in Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1 and verse, um, Acts chapter 1 verse 4 to 5, the Bible says, on 4 to 5, the Bible says, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you, have re which you have heard me speak about. 
For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That was another confirmation from our, our Lord Jesus Christ. Number three, this was fulfilled at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, that when I read uh, where the disciples came and gathered and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. This was the baptism in the Holy Spirit that had, hap had been promised by Jesus. It was the mark that the disciples were now initiated into the realm of the Holy Spirit. What is the significance of Holy Spirit baptism or what is the importance? The Holy Spirit baptism marked a significant turning point in the life and ministry of the disciples. The men and women who had been waiting in the upper room in fear of persecution were transformed into a different kind of people. Several changes are notable. Number one, the disciples became bold witness. They became bold witness. That is found in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1 to 37. We will not read that scripture here because of time. The baptism of the Holy Spirit emboldens the believer to share his or her faith with others. Praise the Lord. I know some of us, even when you, maybe I just speak on you and I tell you to come in front here, you will tell me no. Sometimes in meetings I've, I've, chosen, I've uh, chosen people to pray. I've just said so and so pray for us. Somebody has said no. They are not even able to pray. If you are not even able to pray the Lord's Prayer, tell me how will you share your faith? You need the baptism in the Holy Spirit for boldness. Some of us even are in our places of work, nobody knows whether we are born again or not. Eh? In fact, if a believer comes there and they say, praise the Lord, you shy away. Some of us even lock our doors and we behave as if we don't know those people. Why? We don't have the boldness. The boldness comes from baptism in the Holy Spirit. Number two, they cultivated a special spirit of devotion. Acts chapter 2, 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. This implication is that the Holy Spirit creates in the believer a special de desire for spiritual things. As um, Paul has told us, Apostle Paul has told us in, uh, in, Acts chapter, in Romans chapter 8 and verse 5, he says, uh, those who, have, who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. So these people had um, a cultivated a special spirit of devotion. They were so much devoted to the apostles' teaching and breaking of bread. They were coming, they were looking out up to the time of fellowship so that they can go and pray together, go and hear the word of God, and go and uh, evangelize, tell people about Jesus Christ. They were looking up to it because their mind was set on the things that are above. And that is the spirit of devotion that we need in the church. Number three, the disciples witnessed signs and wonders in their ministry. Acts chapter 2 verse 43, the Bible says, everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. These people did signs and wonders. Miracles happened because of the 
uh, power they were having, the power that was coming from the Holy Spirit. This, remember, this, these are the same, same disciples we look, we find in the book of, uh, of Mark 9, 17 to 18. They are the same one, the same one. Mark 19, 17 to 18. Mark 9, not 19, sorry. 17 to 18, the Bible says, a man in a crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it is seized, it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He forms at the mouth, gnash, gnashes his teeth, and become, becomes rigid. I, I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. These are the disciples initially who could not even de 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 drive out ev even a fly. They were not able. But now because of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the Bible says miracles, signs, and wonders were performed by them. People like Peter, you remember when they met that lame man at the beautiful gate, and he said he wanted money from them, they said, uh, Peter said, silver have I none, but have I none. But in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And immediately the man uh, threw uh, uh, away he, the, the, whatever he was using to walk, and he rose and he went away praising the Lord. Great signs and wonders they were performing. We realized that the disciples had the disciples had completely been transformed in their ministry. And I know we are here and we are wondering, why am I not even able to trust God even only to heal a, a, a flu? You have never been able, you have never trusted God to heal even the simple ailment. You need the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The implication here is that the Holy Spirit empowers for extraordinary spiritual gifts. Number four, the disciples developed a unique sense of unity. After the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, a new sense of togetherness togetherness and generosity developed among the disciples. In the book of Acts chapter 2 verse 44 to 45, these people were so united and they were so generous. And uh, the senior pastor liked preaching about uh, giving, that uh, he wants to be the greatest giver. But I don't know whether he can, he can match to this a group because they gave over a hundred percent praise the Lord because they sold everything they had and they were sharing with those among them that they were in need there was great generosity there was um, togetherness unity they were so bonded together something that is maybe lacking in our church today, we need the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Then when you compare this, that Acts chapter 2, verse 44 to 45, with Paul's evaluation of the contact of the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I'll get it and read to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3 to 4. Paul was uh, saying this. If we compare that, he says, For when one says, I follow Paul, another, I follow Apollos. Are you not me, amen? What, what after all is Apollos and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned each his task. I think I left out verse 3. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? 
This is the church of Corinth that Paul was in. Was in. And if you compare this church with the, 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 the early church, you find that there is a very big difference. The church in Corinth, they were worldly as Paul uh, is, is calling them. They were carnal. They were, they, they were jealousy. They were quarreling among themselves. They were fighting. And they were following their leaders instead of following Jesus Christ. And some of these things we can see them uh, even in the church of today. Why is it that many fellowships break up? Why is it that they break up? Why is it that uh, uh, even servants of God, you find them exchanging or fighting and breaking even the fellowship of brethren? Why is it that there is tribalism in the church? One person says, I'm a Kalenjin. Another one says, I'm a Luya. You want to identify with your tribe. Why is it that we are inclined to political affiliation? That is what Paul is saying, carnality and worldliness. We need the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Is spirit baptism different from being spirit-filled? Is spirit baptism different from being a spirit-filled? Though sometimes spirit baptism is used interchangeably with being spirit-filled, they seem to be different. Spirit baptism occurs once. The term baptism generally refers to an act of initiation. And initiations are generally one-time events. For example, a person was circumcised only once in order to join the family of God under the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 17, 9 to 11. And if I may I ask our brethren who come from this locality, who of us has circumcised their boy twice or thrice? Nobody, isn't it? It is only once because it is an initiation. So we get baptized in the Holy Spirit once because it is an initiation. Then we come to be spirit to be spirit-filled is continuous or repeated. The biblical incidents of being filled with the Holy Spirit imply repeated occurrence in the life of, of the individual. Similarly, the call or command to be filled with the Holy Spirit signify a continuous requirement. Acts chapter 4, verse 8, the Bible says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said, Rulers and elders of the people. Remember, Peter had been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and now uh, the Bible says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. The filling with the Holy Spirit, when we get baptized in the Holy Spirit, we continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit. How? By abiding continually, abiding in the vine, by dwelling in prayers, by reading and doing the word of God, by praying and fasting, by sharing uh, the message of the love of Jesus Christ with those around us. That is continual abiding, continual abiding. That is what it means to uh, continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Baptism is once, but is continuous. In Ephesians chapter 5, 18, uh, Paul told this church, do not be drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit continually. Yes, we were baptized. We were not 
to remain there and saying that we are now baptized, I talk in tongues, there is nothing more that I can do. No, we continue abiding and we continue uh, uh, to be filled with the Holy Spirit daily. That is why uh, when Peter and the apostles continued in breaking the word together in prayer, they were able to counterattack even there the people who are opposing them. And the Bible says that morning Peter was full of the Holy Spirit. I don't know where, when we, re we receive oppositions even in our places of work, whether we are able to counter attack the works of the enemy. The thing is be filled with the Holy Spirit daily or continually. Is the spirit baptism necessary? One of the questions that has been debated among theologians and ordinary Christians alike is whether the baptism in the Holy Spirit is necessary for every believer. This is similar to asking whether circumcision was necessary for every believer under the Abrahamic covenant. Of course it was. And also, um, if I may just go back to uh, the question I asked, is circumcision necessary for Kalenjin boys to be associated with the Kalenjin community? Yes, it is. It is. I'm yet to see one who, or I may not know, but... I don't think there is one who is not circumcised. At least at some point, they'll be circumcised. That one is a condition. So, likewise, it is apparent that we need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit if we are to operate effectively in the realm of the Holy Spirit. We need to be baptized. That means it is very necessary uh, for every believer to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Paul encouraged the Ephesians to receive the Holy Spirit baptism. During his missionary visit to Ephesus, Paul questioned the believers about their encounter with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 19, verse 1 to 4. Since they were already believers, the Holy Spirit was definitely already dwelling in them, for no one can be a believer without the Holy Spirit. Remember I said uh, the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. At that point when you get born again, the Holy Spirit is abiding in you, but that is not the baptism. He is with you. That is why you are able to say Jesus is Lord. You have the Holy Spirit within you. He then led them to the experience in Acts chapter 19, verse 5 to 7. The Bible says they were baptized into the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. The Holy Spirit baptism authenticated Gentile believers. One of the biggest debate among the leadership of the early church was whether the uncircumcised believers could be accepted into the fellowship of believers. This matter was settled in Cornelius' house where Peter had been sent to preach. In Acts chapter 10, verse 44 to 47, the Bible says that while Peter was still preaching to them, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. I wish that happens to me. That while I'm still preaching to you, you just start speaking in tongues and prophesying. Amen. For the, the Bible says, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. So this one is just confirming uh, what Joel the prophet had prophesied, that God will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Both Gentile and the Jews were filled with the Holy Spirit. 
What is the evidence of Holy Spirit baptism? It seems clear from scripture that in all cases of baptism in the Holy Spirit, there was a public evidence. Number one, at the upper room, all spoke in other tongues. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. Number two, in Cornelius' house, they spoke in tongues and praised God. Acts chapter 10, verse 44 to 46. Number three, in Ephesus, they spoke in tongues and prophesied. In Acts chapter 19, verse 3 to 6. You can read that. Jesus reaffirmed this in Mark 16 and verse 17 to 18 when he was commissioning the disciples. I'll read that. Mark 16, 17 to 18, the Bible says, and these signs will accompany those who believe who believe in my name they will drive out demons they will speak in new tongues they will pick up snakes with their hands and when they drink deadly poison it will not hurt them at all they will place their hands on the sick people and they will get well jesus said those who will believe in him one of the things they were going to benefit from it was to speak in new tongues Therefore, speaking in tongues is the initial evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And that is what we believe in as Christ is the answer ministry. There is a note there I want us to note. We have two kinds of tongues. Number one. The initial evidence of baptism in the Holy Spirit. This is for all believers. The initial evidence. All believers uh, who are filled in the Holy Spirit must have that outward evidence of speaking in tongues. And these tongues are for self-edification. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 4a, you will read that uh, these tongues as a, a sign that you are filled with the Holy Spirit are for self-edification. They are edifying you, which means when you continue speaking in tongues, when you continue just abiding in him, you continue to edify yourself. Why? When you allow the Holy Spirit of God to intercede on your behalf, the Holy Spirit of God is God himself. He is all knowing. He, he knows the mind of God about you and he knows your mind. So he intercedes for you the things that you cannot uh, intercede with your uh, ordinary mind. The Holy Spirit of God will intercede for you. Maybe the end he has just laid a trap for you so that when you leave your house, you are knocked with a motorbike, but you, the Spirit of God wakes you early in the morning and you pray in tongues. You didn't just realize that you are to die that day, but the Holy Spirit of God, who is all-knowing, has interceded for you. Praise the Lord. Number two, tongues as a gift. We have another kind of tongue, and this is tongues as a gift. This is not for all people. This is for church edification. In, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 4b, you will realize Paul uh, mentioning about this tongue of church edification, and it is a gift. It is not for everyone. Uh, when we come here and we are worshiping the Lord and worshiping and worshiping and we be silent, someone who has this gift will rise up and begin talking in tongues alone. While we are quiet, either God will give that person the gift of interpretation and they will interpret to us what God is speaking to the church. That is for church edification. 
And Paul was saying, I rather you 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 do what? You prophesy than uh, you speak the tongues of uh, self edification because for self edification they are edifying you alone. But when you have this gift, you will be edifying the entire body of Jesus Christ. So it is a gift. And I think this is where there is a bone of contention with some people who do not believe in talking in tongues. They say talking in tongues is a gift for a particular people. So it is not, not for all people. Yes, this is the, the tongue that is a gift and it is not for all people. But for the initial evidence is for all who believe in Jesus Christ. So we have nine fruit of the Holy Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23. And we have also the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 4 to 11. The difference between this, I know our senior pastor took us through the fruit of the Holy Spirit and even Reverend Kiprop also uh, talked about it and Reverend To also talked about it, about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The difference between the fruit of the Holy Spirit and the gift is that um, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is the character of Jesus Christ. And it is depends on your own initiative to grow in the character of Jesus Christ. It is you to continue in reading of the word, in doing the word of God, in prayer, and just continue to abide in the vine and to share uh, the, the, the message of love uh, to other people who are around you. Then you will grow in the character of Jesus Christ. This one you have to will yourself. It will not come to you instantly. But for the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we can be worshiping here in the church. The Bible says, God give to whom he pleases. And these gifts, God will be just dropping him. You can receive a gift of working of miracles. You receive a gift of faith. They are called the, 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 the gift of power. You can receive the gift of discernment of spirits. So this is the power of Jesus Christ. So as believers, we need to endeavor. We need to abide continually so that we can be able to grow in the character and in the power of Jesus Christ that we will become victorious Christians. Amen. Praise the Lord. How can one get baptized in the Holy Spirit? Number one, have a desire. Have a desire. Once you have a desire, you are done. You will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is available for all believers. As Joel prophesied, uh, the Holy Spirit has already been uh, poured upon all flesh. This house is already full of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 7 and verse 37, John chapter 7 and verse 37, uh, this is what John was saying, what Jesus was saying. This was a clarion call uh, in the time of John. And uh, Jesus was calling upon his people in verse from verse 37 to 39. The Bible say, on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this, he meant the spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that, that time, the spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So the thing is, you have to desire, you have to thirst. I like the thirst of this uh, Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts chapter 8. This Ethiopian eunuch, when, uh, 
when Philip was evangelizing him um, in verse 36 and 37, the Bible says, as they travel along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why should, shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. It is us. That urge should be there. You see, this Ethiopian eunuch, he didn't wait for Peter to say, um, um, Peter to say that you go to the new believers class, you go learn about baptism or what. Whatever he heard Philip telling him really caught him. And he gained that thirst and the urge. When he saw the water, he even wanted to jump in by himself. But he could not baptize himself. He told Philip, why can't you baptize me? That is the urge. Number two, the father is ready and willing to give all who ask. In Luke chapter 11, in Luke chapter 11, Luke chapter 11, verse 11 to 13, this is what, um, what, Jesus, what Jesus was telling his disciples. Luke chapter 11, verse 11 to 13. He says, which of you fathers, if your son asks you for fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks you for an egg, he will give you a scorpion. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him? I'm not talking about any evil spirit here. Anybody who wants to be filled with the spirit of the living God, he will be given the Holy Spirit of God. And <clears throat> Jesus was asking the disciples, who of you, though you are evil, your child can ask you for a fish and you give them a, a snake instead. Or he asks for an egg and you give him a scorpion. As evil as we are, we really love our children. And when they ask for us anything, we give exactly what they have asked for. And Jesus said, how much more is me who is not evil will give you the Holy Spirit when you ask for. The Lord is more than willing to fill us with the Holy Spirit. Amen. I like this uh, writer, A.W. Toza, who said he normally comments on Holy Spirit baptism baptism. So he says, if God were to take the Holy Spirit out of this world, much of what we are doing in our churches will go on and nobody will know the difference. Nobody. This is what he commended. And I tend to agree with him. Why did he say this? Because the church has locked the Holy Spirit out. And we are doing our own things minus the Holy Spirit. That is why even if God can come and take away the Holy Spirit, we will continue doing the things we are doing here. Why? Because we are doing these things with our own might and our own strength. Praise the Lord. And I want to challenge you today, church, that we need the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God for us to be able to counterattack the things that the enemy is doing even in our generation. In the first service, I was giving them a, um, a testimony, something that happened last week. Uh, on Sunday after service, there are, uh, the ministry I had, one of them had just received a bereavement. And they came and wanted me to go with them, and I was busy. I told them, go, I'll come later. So in the week, I went to that funeral. And I just wanted to know what happened, because I had had um, uh, a nephew of this sister had committed suicide. So I thought it is a big person, a grown-up person. So it shocked me when first I heard it was a 12-year-old. 
So I wanted to hear uh, what really happened. And they told me they don't know anything. Nobody had quarreled him. The grandmother loved this boy very, very much. And he was a good boy. No one could suspect. The teachers came. They looked in his back just to see if they can get a last note. There was no last note. This boy was just playing with others on Sunday, um, and all of a sudden, he got lost. And the grandmother, because he loved him, he started looking for him. They didn't find him. They called the relatives. He was not there. And at around nine at night, when one of the child in the house said he has not even fed the rabbit, and while they were going to feed, the child was going to feed the rabbit, came across this small boy hanging. He was already dead. So we were wondering what really happened. What really happened to this young boy? And uh, the auntie was telling us that this young boy loved to watch a program. There is this program. It is a nation program I hear. The children watch it. It so deepens them. And I think there are some spirits that are released and they reach at the, some point and they are told, commit, if you commit suicide, you will be a hero. So our dear small children think when they commit suicide, they will come back to life. And this sister told us when they took the body to the morgue, they found three more children on that particular day who had committed suicide. One age 14, another one age 9, and two age 12. You can imagine. And we are talking about only Washingishu County. What about other counties? What is happening in other towns? If our children are watching such programs, if our children are being initiated in things that we do not know, that is why that clip you are using us is very important to the church. Because we cannot continue to recite our vision and mission day in, day out, and we are doing nothing about it. We need to get out and reach out to our children in primary schools. We need to reach them out in our estates through Bible clubs. We need to reach our teenagers in high school. That is on those who are only children. We've not talked about the challenges of teenagers. We need to reach to our uh, young people in the universities. Thank God our senior pastor is from ministering to our young people. We need to get out here, a community of believers impacting the world. We need the infilling of the Holy Spirit for us to go out. And we were talking about uh, the, 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 what the, the ruling of the court recently on LGBTQ. They had said that they are free to register their organization through the NGOs. You can imagine the society that we are in with the power of God, we will not manage. We need the power. We need the power like yesterday. We need to be filled daily for us to do the works that God has called us to do. Choir, you can come. I want as the choir come. Think about yourself. How has been your walk with the Lord? We are not just singing songs here about abiding in the vine. We are very serious and very intentional. And we will give you all the platforms that you need to go outside there and impact the world. The same yesterday we went to pray for, cancer, for a cancer patient. One of us, the parent, was sick. And when we went there... We immediately we finished, the neighbor of this one came and said, do not leave us alone. Come and pray. So we went and I led this cancer patient to Christ. And after it all, they were so happy. And when we were going, they came and said, Pastor, think about just coming to hospital and leading people to Christ. There are so many people. People are dying of cancer. People are dying of chronic ailments. And they need the church. They need you and 
me. Praise the Lord. I want us to be upstanding. If you are there, you've never had the encounter of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I want you to march to the front. Don't fear. Just come. You want to be in field. You want, maybe you are filled with the Holy Spirit and you no longer even talk in tongues. Maybe you backslid. I want you to come in front here. We want to pray together. We want to lay our hands and we are trusting God. God has already poured the Holy Spirit in this room. It is only you to take the step of faith and receive the Holy Spirit. Those of us who are already speaking in tongues, raise up your hand and start talking in tongues. Talk in a new language. Those of us who are not yet filled, you can march to the front. Our God is faithful. Hallelujah. Surrender to God as you come. Surrender to God. He's going to fill you with the Holy Spirit.